Jan Ott, welcome back to Stavoren. It's wonderful to see you again. So two and a half years ago, you educated me about the Erlinda book, and I was fascinated. You came and you spoke at our dinner, and um, we were in Lewarden, and uh, I said, we have to do an interview. <laughs> and one thing led to another, and you said, well, I'm about to publish a whole new English edition. Yes. And you did. And uh, so we started to work on an interview, and then you also published a second English edition in paperback. So for the people watching, what is the Aralinda book? Yeah, it's a manuscript, a handwritten text that uh, became known in the 1870s. Uh, we are in Friesland here. Friesland is one of the Dutch provinces. Mm -hmm. And in the Friesian uh, archives, there is this manuscript. Right. And even before the first translation was published in the newspapers and magazines, there was already a consensus that it was fake and that anyone who would take it seriously uh, was a fool. Right. Now, Friesland has their own language, the Frisian mm -hmm. language. In fact, we were just up at the Frisian Institute. We have a wonderful picture that we'll use for this commentary of you holding the original manuscript. So, but the original manuscript is in Old Frisian, correct? Yes, uh, the critics would say it's an imitation of Old Frisian, uh -huh. but it's much, it most resembles the Old Frisian of the old laws that, that are known. This would be so old that German, English, Dutch, but also Scandinavian languages descend from it. Many of the words have cognates in all the Northern European languages, yeah. Yeah. but there are also words that have only survived in, in particular dialects. When I discovered this book, and I also read all the discussions about it, I recognized it as really something significant. The theories about it did not really make sense. There were no good reasons to reject it as, as inauthentic. And even if it would have been, um, even if it would be a 19th century fiction uh, creation, then it would be, still be so significant in the history of literature. Mm -hmm. for the Netherlands, because it's a book, uh, 190 pages in the original manuscript, all in this supposedly uh, reconstructed old language, even in a script that's not really mm -hmm. uh, familiar. Some letters are, are recognizable, yeah, like the W, A, uh, the R. There are letters that you can recognize, but also e. some letters that are really different. Yeah. There are three different A's two different E's, uh, different O's, etc. Uh, there's one letter for NG, mm -hmm. also like the, in the runes. But this would be, this would be such a um, unique piece of work that it would also deserve attention if it would be uh, a forgery. Right. And the way in which the people who studied it, who took it seriously, were uh, marginalized or ridiculed yeah. It was for me a red flag that there is something interesting there. Yeah, if you look at the attacks like that, you know, it's very similar to some of the attacks we see today. I mm. mean, this, they've been using these attacks for a long, long time. You see this when they're trying to destroy something that they don't want mm. to endure. You know, it's a real effort to delete something from the public mind. We know that in our history, there have been many book burnings. Mm -hmm. And after every war, the victor would decide what the history would become and what, right. what parts would have been erased. It's the same when you study a family history or a right. genealogy, you find that certain stories are ignored or have been changed. Right. So that happens in uh, big history, of course, uh, as well. And when you read these texts, it's easy to imagine why the cultural establishment in the 1800s would have uh, not wanted this to become big. So the, the challenges in my experience over the centuries, the secret societies do plant manuscripts. Mm -hmm. They really do. And so, and they have a lot of resources to make them impressive. So you always run into the problem here. Is it planted? You know, because it's not just some guy with his imagination coming up with it. Mm -hmm. It's a real plant. So is it planted or is it real? And I think what you're saying, which I think is very important, is it's significant either way. 
I would think so, yeah. And right. for it being having been planted, there needs to be a, a motive. What would the purpose uh, have been of the people who planted it? There is one theory that uh, uh, a preacher who was also a poet, mm -hmm. a, a vicar, a village um, parson, yeah. that he created the narrative and that a friend of his who was a linguist would have transferred it into this old Frisian and that another who came out with it, that he would have made a script. So uh, a right. conspiracy of these three people, uh -huh. but it's not realistic. I have written a short right. article. It doesn't make sense. <clears throat> no. For different reasons. They would all have lied, and also people around them. Right. Even posthumously, they didn't leave anything that points out uh, to this. The linguist would have left because he wrote about etymology. Mm -hmm. It should be possible to recognize his signature. And there have been meticulous studies to try to prove him guilty. Yeah, right. There's no uh, good evidence for it. Right. The, um, the man over the linden, yeah, which is Ura Linda, would have been an older version of that name. He was um, a Navy shipyard superintendent. He was a generation older than the other two. In the time that they would have gotten to know each other, they were about to get married, remarried. They had a life. They had to work for a living. They would have had to communicate by mail about this all the time because they lived very far apart. The linguist who would have uh, cooperated, he would have really have risked uh, not only his career, but also criminal prosecution because he, at some point he uh, asked the government for, um, for money to purchase the manuscript. Mm -hmm. and to have it translated. And if it would have come out that he was involved, uh, that would have been a crime. Right. So let's assume that it's authentic for a second. Mm -hmm. the, the person who brought it forward, the, the pastor. No, that was the... The pastor was one of the suspects of the official th theory. Right. The Navy shipyard superintendent. He brought it forward. Yeah. Now, he had it from his family, or...? He said he had had it since 1848 as an inheritance, as a family uh, treasure. He had inherited it. Right. And he had tried to uh, read it himself, to translate it. Uh -huh. And when he was older, uh, at some point, he got the idea to ask help at the Frisian Society for Language and History. That was a, a group of people in Leeuwarden at high positions, um, notable people. The linguist who was one of, who would later become one of the suspects, uh, at first judged it to be authentic and of, of significance. Later, he withdrew that uh, position, <laughs> probably that for obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, one of the older members of the society translated it and he became convinced that it was authentic. So let's dive in because you can't understand why someone might want to censor this until you understand the contents. Mm -hmm. So tell us what the Erlinda book says. It says that in the 6th century BC, in our common timeline, there are reasons to doubt that the first millennium was really a thousand years, but in the 6th century before our year zero, Texts would have been uh, brought together from the various burgs or strongholds that there were. Because, in Friesland. Yeah, Friesland, but also in what is now the Netherlands or even Germany. And there was a threat of invasion and uh, they decided to copy all the texts that were inscribed on the walls of burgs, mostly. Right. And some of those texts already were very old. The oldest uh, events that are described are a cataclysmic event in which the old land or the Atland, the Atland had sub submerged, which would have been 2,200 years before our year zero. Mm -hmm. But that's the oldest text. These texts were brought together in the 6th century BC, and then later texts were added by the people who had that manuscript in their possession. Right. And that the youngest of the reports are from about the year zero. And then there are two letters of instruction, one 
page each, one from the year 803 and one from the year 1255. And most narratives are from the time of Alexander the Great, 300 years BC, and what happened when a lot of people re-migrated back here. Right. And much of it is uh, 6th century BC, and also uh, a part which is mainly laws. One of the things, one of the reasons I got very interested when you first said 600, I've been reading about the Zoroastrians, because one Frisian told me that the um, the king that founded Stavoran had gone to uh, Persia and had studied Zoroastrianism, and that group, when they came back, brought that philosophy, introduced it back. And... Um, you know, that there was, because we're talking about a group of people who were phenomenally well-traveled around the globe. Yes, it was a seafaring yeah. uh, nation, and uh, they have founded colonies in the Mediterranean already mm. uh, 1500 years BC, and later on there was a colony in northwest India, in the Indus Valley uh, region. Right. And at some point, many of them also re-migrated back, right. if, if this is true. Spice traders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it would explain a uh, lot of language similarities also with sans Sanskrit, eh? yeah. the, the Indo-European um, connection. Yeah. Yeah, so come back to the question, why would it have been controversial? Uh, one of the main themes is freedom. Yes. And uh, the danger of uh, losing. I would not say one of them, I would say the yeah. main theme is freedom. Yeah. Probably. And how you keep it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. In the primal laws by the folk mother Freya, by the, the personification of their primal mother, who they named Freya. There is a set of laws that she would have left. And one of the laws is to um, never accept anyone in, in their middle who has sold his own freedom right. or who takes the freedom of another. Right. And the reasoning behind it is that people with a slave mentality invite people to rule over them. And when people rule over others and they get ever more power, it will corrupt them and a lot of misery will be the result of that. Right. There, for me, there is, when I read the Erlinda book, there is so much instruction on how to conduct yourself so that you can be part of a group of people who stay free. So there's a lot of instruction on reminding people what they have to do to remain free and how bad things can get if they even let one bad dog in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's very, um, you know, for me, it's very good. It's very fun to read it because it's true. One of the primal laws is also that if one of the daughters or sons want to marry with someone from another race, it should be um, disadvised. But if they really insist, they are free to go, but they can never re uh, return. Right. Because, they, because then they would, they might bring uh, foreign morals. Right. And they were very uh, eager, uh, very strict on keeping their morals pure. Right. Because they speak of the three uh, primal races, but from the beginning, one of those races intentionally kidnapped daughters right. of this group to have their blood, but to also um, invade. It was a sort of warfare without weapons, without right. really fighting. Right. Also corrupting the morals, making use of the weak uh, weaknesses of the leaders. They could be bought. Right. And uh, there's a lot of covert warfare that is explained in these texts. Well, you can see why the people who want to centralize control do not want this teaching circulating. There's a lot of wisdom in it. Knowledge is power. Um, so one of the things I found fascinating was the attention given to governance structures and, and how to organize and train people to provide leadership and governance. And they have this one uh, practice, which I find absolutely fascinating, which is you take the older women of the sort of tribe and being an older woman, you know, I, I resonate with this, taking the older women in the tribe and preparing them for a governance or leadership position. And one of the things they require them to do to get more experience is they send them down the Rhine to sort of study and learn about other people. Before they would become a folk mother. Uh -huh. There were folk, there were burg mothers. Yeah. And on each burg there were maidens. 
and one of them might become fo- uh, a Berg mother later. And there was uh-huh. one folk mother at the main Berg of Texel or Texel, Texland. And the, they would not really have power, but they would have influence. They would have all the wisdom mm-hmm. and they could uh, do counselings. They could also be severely punished if they would give, uh, intentionally would give bad counselling. So they did not have, have absolute power. Mm-hmm. They were like a bit like the Vestal Virgins later, mm-hmm. which is also described in this book, how they became known later. Right. So uh, I, that one captured me. I'd just been in Sofia three years ago to see Wagner's Ring. And of course it opens with the Rhine maidens protecting the, um, the gold. And if you come into my apartment, I've got a, a print of the one artist who did a scene from, the, from Wagner with the Rhine maidens protecting the gold. And so I just found the Rhine maidens suddenly appearing to be a very interesting coincidence. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are many things that, that um, come back in our culture. Right. So I should just mention the Rhine flows through from Switzerland to Germany, and then it splits in the Netherlands into three distributaries, <coughs> one of which flows in the Isomere, which we're, we're right mm-hmm. next to the Isomere here. And if you look at the trade coming from Switzerland and Germany up the Rhine, it's very, very significant economically here. There must have been a strong culture here. Right. Because it's a very tactical place to have, with all the sweet water, the mm-hmm. fertile lands, the oak wood that used to be plenty here, plus the, the rivers. Yeah, and um, the extraordinary animal protein. <laughs> yeah, and, and so if there would not have been a strong culture here, it would long ago have been conquered by right. Mediterranean peoples who supposedly would have a superior culture. And then they would have occupied it here. And we would now be speaking a language that's more similar to one of the Mediterranean. So language. if you look, the Frisians defeated the Dutch in 1345 at the Battle of Warrens. Mm-hmm. And it took when? Until the 1500s for the Dutch to finally incorporate Friesland into, the, into Holland, I think. For a long time, it was one of the provinces that was one of the United Netherlands. Mm-hmm. Yeah, West Friesland, which is on the other side of the right. big lake was conquered earlier in the 13th right. century. Right, so you could see why in 15, in, uh, in 1800 they might not want the Frisians to adopt this philosophy. <laughs> yeah, for hundreds of years there has been a struggle between uh, the Counts of Holland with the Frisians because they didn't want to pay taxes. Right. And they thought they had a privilege from the time of Charlemagne to not mm-hmm. pay taxes. And it was a That's strong... That's right, Charlemagne made a deal with the Frisians. Supposedly. That they, yeah. It's not clear if that's really historical. Really true. But uh, at least there's this tradition. And uh, one of the Frisian um, ideas is also uh, that they would rather be dead than slave. Mm-hmm. It's still very well known. It's very understandable that the, the new kingdom of the Netherlands from the 19th century would not promote Frisian nationality too much. The king of the Netherlands in the 1820s, I think, offered a lot of money to historians back then to write the Dutch history, which would of course glorify his family and and their past, and uh, who would leave out all the parts that were not so favorable to them. Right. And this was only a few decades later that this book became known, so if, they, uh, if the king uh, would have known the content, he would have openly forbidden it, but it would probably have worked indirectly. So when I dive into the Erlinda book, I discover something that I, I find again and again and again, which is history is very different than we were taught. Official history is a mess. Right. Uh, there's this meme, uh, if you know how bad our news is, imagine how bad history is. <laughs> that, that's really true. And, I look at it because I have not been schooled as a historian or as a linguist, uh, perhaps with a fresh look. For people who are really emotionally invested in, in the official history, it will be more difficult to let go of certain ideas. But if you look at this with an open mind, if you really go investigate the, the um, reasoning 
behind the rejection of this text, I invite scholars and researchers to really argue why this cannot possibly be authentic. Mm -hmm. That's why I've translated it into English, because here in the Netherlands, in the academic world, there seems to be a taboo to even ask that question. Right. Of course, it's not only a Dutch uh, matter, this, because if it's true, the history is so old that it's also the history of the, no, not, o not even only the Western civilization, but also in India and um, right. uh, much more of the world. And... Again, you can also look at it as a literature or as fiction, and then you'll see that's still interesting. Well, to me, if, if, if it is a planted manuscript, it still says a great deal about freedom and how to achieve it. Because yeah. you can't, a people can't be free unless they're willing to conduct themselves in a certain way. And that starts with each person. So I used to always have this problem in Washington. You know, the politicians would say, what do we do to fix this? And I say, well, you have to raise the children right. And they yeah. said, that takes too long. <laughs> well, that's also one of the things that they say here. Yeah. Uh, make sure that your daughters are really good Freya women, because they will pass on the culture and language. Right. They're the most important key in uh, raising a good people. Right. I see my fellow man being taught how to be powerless by being encouraged to adopt the habits that produce slavery mm -hmm. or accept slavery or accommodate slavery. And, and so as a group, they lose the power individually. They, they lose their individual sovereignty by choice or distraction, and then they have no potential to fight for their freedom as it comes to be taken away. Mm -hmm. Well, we've seen now here, uh, the Netherlands has every year celebrated Freedom Day, the Liberation Day. And there's always been much talk about human rights, but now that it's really relevant to, to preserve our freedom or to really talk about it, uh, most people uh, don't even see what's happening. And um, there's this saying, uh, uh, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. Right. Just to, to create the illusion of freedom, right. yeah, you have freedom to choose 10 different types of peanut butter <laughs> in, the, in the groceries. <laughs> so people talk about freedom, but they don't really realize it when, when it's taken away from them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So talk a little bit to us about the Frisian language, because this is in Old Frisian, or what you said was thought to be Old Frisian. Tell us what the Frisian language is now and how it relates to to what you translated. You spoke Frisian when the when you first found the Orlinda book, or did you have to no, revive I'm a, your Frisian? I'm a West Frisian, yeah. which is not part of the province of Friesland. It's a part of the province of North Holland, right. north of Amsterdam. And we had the a sort of dialect, but it was already much uh, more um, diluted, and it is not promoted like here. Mm -hmm. We were taught to speak um, civilized Dutch at school. Right. So I know a bit of the West Frisian dialect. The name Holland also only came into existence in the year 1000, around the year 1000. Before yeah. that, it was all Frisia. On old maps, you can see Frisia was from, from Belgium. And it's still in Germany, there's a part called Eastern Frisia, mm -hmm. Oost Friesland. Even part of Denmark is North Friesland. Mm -hmm. So it was the whole coastline from Denmark to Belgium. So Dutch would also be a descendant from Old Frisian, from this language. It would also have other influences from fr right. Frankish, Frankish. And modern Frisian, there are actually many varieties of the Frisian language, right. the spoken varieties. Uh, there is one, one, a common standardized Frisian, which they teach in courses, and the uh, written Frisian, I think, is a, is a bit artificial. It's more an instruction of how it should be pronounced. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the words wind and land, they're the same in Dutch, English, German, all with an D at the end. Only in Friesland, they, uh, the they write wien and laan mm -hmm. <laughs> without a D. There's a lot of subsidies here 
for for language projects to to keep it like this and that's part of the reason why they want to be as separate from from dutch as possible right it's an ident- it has become an identity thing in which they if they can choose between a perfectly frisian dutch a word that is similar to dutch and a less well-known word that's typically frisian they will choose the frisian word so it's very interesting i spent about 10 years driving around america talking to all my elders the oldest people in my family. I learned a tremendous amount of history about my family. But one of the things I learned was the generations kept being tricked because they never did a lessons learned on who tricked them and how they got tricked. And then it gets lost and then they get tricked again and then they get tricked Mm. again. And I said, you know, we need to start learning our history. Yes. Yes, we do. Yes, that's how I also started with the family history. Mm Mm-hmm. It's so interesting because you find out things that were uh, not told or that were um, changed. Mm -hmm. And by understanding your roots, you understand yourself better. Yeah. yeah, I've learned much from the theories of uh, Rupert Sheldrake with Mm -hmm. resonance. So a lot of it is in our subconscious. Yeah. And when you can make it conscious, you can uh, more uh, consciously um, make decisions. I want to go back to your journey, but before I do, tell us what else in here you would like to bring out in this discussion, the things that most speak to you. It really makes a lot of sense, many of the laws, and maybe not at first read. I have had so many aha moments about language and about origin of things in our culture. Mm -hmm. Many things come back in other religions that we know, right. like in Christianity, much is recognizable. There's one law about usury that was strictly forbidden. Right. And uh, in the context, in the whole, it also makes sense. It is, uh, it's explained. So the history of the man is once usury is adopted, it is a fait accompli that that civilization will fail. It's a question of how long it will mm-hmm. take. Yeah. Right. Same with the corruption of morals and of accepting slavery, slave mentality as well. Mm-hmm. So I think the Erlinda book is very relevant, whether it's authentic or not. And the reason is, one, you know, we're going through a period where the law is collapsing and failing, mm-hmm. the rule of law. And the question is, okay, how can I create, you know, back to Sheldrake, how can I create a field where I can share a covenant with people as to the law and it being a law which can preserve our freedom. You know, so we're back at the stage where we have to, we may have to reinvent everything from scratch. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in looking back in history and saying, okay, what has worked? You know, there's a reason I'm in Stavorn, and that is if you drive to the Red Cliffs, which is not far from here, you see it up on the Red Cliff, you know, better de- dead than slave, yeah. you know, and that's what I'm always saying to people. Death is not the worst thing that can happen. No, absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so let's come back to you and your personal journey. So you started the foundation, you published this book, now you've published the paperback. This book sold out quickly. You underestimated the demand. <laughs> yeah. Um, this book is now selling. What has the response, what has happened to you as uh, as a result of now presenting this and, and getting this disseminated into the world? Well, there's some weight from my back. I had the translation ready in 2018 already, and I thought there would be a, a publishing house uh, contacting me if they could publish it, <laughs> but it didn't happen. And that's why I um, started the foundation to yeah. do it myself. Now, you've got the whole book in here. Yeah. All it's the, amazing. This is the first edition with uh, color copies of the whole manuscript, all pages. Now, these are all up at the Frisian Institute in yeah. the library. Right. So I've added line numbers and then the transliteration and the translation, they alternate. So you can easily always compare the translation to the transliteration. I've added chapter titles. I have added an alternative reading order because the manuscript order is not always chronological. Right. And I added a list of persons and cities and places. Well, there are many um, indications that there was a a group of people 
who left traces all over the world. Mm -hmm. And official historiography doesn't really um, consider them as, as one. Or Does that tie back to what the, the land that was destroyed really is? Atlant or Atlantis. So that's the question, is Atlant Atlantis? Well, this, these texts suggest they have a timeline that started with the destruction of Atlant, the old land. And there's obviously um, a connection between the word Atlantis and this Atlant or Atlant. Mm -hmm. But because it means old land, it can also have meant the old world right. before the cataclysm. Right. Some people may have referred to a particular island or a coastline. Right. But it could also just have been the old land that had been lost. So the Frisian Institute is researching the law. The, the old law books. The history of the old law yeah. and the law books. Yes. Is there other research happening that that I'm not aware of? Uh, they do um, a lot of research, but not on the Uralinde book, as far as I know. Right. Right. And if, if someone would at least uh, write a... A modern uh, and with the new insights, with everything we have learned from archaeology in the last uh, uh -huh. decades, explaining why it cannot possibly be authentic, I would really welcome that. Mm -hmm. So I can try to debunk that or uh, give another opinion about it. But that doesn't exist. The most uh, scholarly work that exists about Ural in the book was published in 2004. It was a doctoral thesis on a theological faculty in the Netherlands, uh -huh. uh, Goffe Jensma. But it started from the assumption that it has to be a 19th century forgery. forgery. Right. And from that uh, assumption, he uh, theorized about who could have made it and why. I think you should first establish why it cannot be authentic. Right. I can very well imagine that when you read this for the first time, it's so different from what you would expect if you know the official history, that many people will reject it simply because it's easier to reject it. It's when you consider the possibility that it's authentic, it triggers so many thoughts like, oh, this is different, this is then also different. And especially if you are invested uh, emotionally in, in history, Mm -hmm. You have to rethink your whole, uh, your whole view of, uh, of the past. So I would say, sitting here, it's December 2021, mm -hmm. and I've spent the last two and a half years off and on learning about the Erlinda book and looking forward to 2022. The number one issue before us, facing every one of us, is will we be free or will we be slaves? Mm -hmm. So I find the Erlinda book to be phenomenally relevant to our situation. Yeah. And the, you know, part of the question of are we going to be free or slave is how, to be wor how do we be worthy of being free? How do we achieve freedom and how do we preserve it and how do we nurture it? Mm -hmm. Because this is just bigger than pushing back the latest push to tyranny. You know, if we're going to push back tyranny for good... Then the question is, okay, how are we going to build a civilization that believes in freedom, practices freedom, and doesn't permit slavery? Because we've been, my whole life, we've been permitting slavery. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's time, as, as we would call it in the world, it's time to push the red button. <laughs> anyway, so to me, this is uh, addressing the most important question of our day.